simply at the sin narrative, then God brings us out of Egypt, which is a type of the world system, our sin. He delivers his people from bondage. They pass through the Red Sea, which is a picture of water baptism. And the wilderness is a place of shaping. It's a place of forming. And the goal of the wilderness or wilderness seasons in our life like we just came out of, often, if you're looking at it through the lenses of the sin narrative, is to work the remnants of Egypt out of us as we're on our way to Canaan, the promised land. So again, with the sin narrative, it is deliverance from sin or deliverance from the world. Then we walk through, pass through the water of baptism. As we walk through the wilderness, we are shaped and we are formed more and more in Christ's likeness, and ultimate salvation is, or salvation is the picture of the rest we are to enter into. Now, that is, if you look at the journey simply from the perspective of sin and salvation. But there was a narrative again before sin ever showed up, and it was this idea of rest that God weaved into the fabric of creation on a whole. And if I were to look at that same parallel, using this picture, not of sin to salvation, but from labor to rest, it gives us another layer of revelation in God's intent for our lives. God never intended for us to do what they did in Egypt. In Egypt, the Bible says that they built bricks and structures for Pharaoh. In fact, when Moses Quick review, came and said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I got you. I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to have them build now with bricks, and I'm not going to give them the straw. They're already worn out, but what they're going to have to do now is they're going to have to go find their own straw. I'm not going to change their workload, so now they're going to have to get there early and leave late. Building with bricks is taxing. Building with bricks is what God was attempting to deliver them from. Not only sin, that's part of it, but his original intent was to give his people a type of rest. And here's the idea. He wanted to deliver them not only from the world, the world system, but part of the world system is building and constructing with brick and not stone. There is nothing in the Bible or nowhere in the Bible where you'll find God building anything that is lasting of substance or that has redemptive purpose are parallels with brick. It is always with stone. Stone was a natural substance that was provided by God, but people were to work with. Brick always represents that which is the construct of mankind. Brick represents our own human ingenuity. Brick represents our labors absent of divine inspiration or mandate. Brick represents purposeless activity. Where God wants us without question to be active. But God's activity is always from not a place of human striving and human effort or human ambition. God's effort is always, or our effort is always from a place of, I want you to say it one more time with me so we can get into this message, rest. Not just physical rest. Not that we cease our labor. But rest speaks of building from a place of divine alignment. It speaks of building from a place of ordered assignment. The, the engine that drove Jesus' behavioral pattern, listen to it. It is not, oh, they really need me out there. They really expect me to do something today. In fact, sometimes Jesus seemed really harsh. Let's talk about that side of Jesus. I know y'all like the TBN Jesus. Peace, man, peace. Peace. But, but I, I want to do a movie 
on the TVMA, Jesus. You know, mature audiences only. You know, he's spitting in the ground and mixing it up and rubbing it in people's eyes. Ugh. They never show that miracle on TV, do they? I mean, where, 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 he, where he, you know, turns the water to wine, keep the party going, Jesus. They don't ever show that one. The Jesus that's so cold-blooded that he understands the rhythm of the beat that he marches to and does not deviate from the rhythm of that beat. He said, I only do what I see my father do in heaven. What I get a revelation of my father desiring for me to do is what I carry out. That kind of Jesus. The Jesus that was so cold-blooded that there was a long line to get in there to hear him speak and to watch him do miracles. And his mother and brothers were at the end of the line. I mean, way back at the end of the line. They sent, you know, some of the security up front and said, Jesus, your mother and brothers are at the back of the line. They're asking for some VIP ticket so that they can come and get into this, this gathering. And Jesus looks at them and says, who's my mother? TVMA Jesus. I mean, the Jesus that throws over tables and, you know, gets crazy when people start interfering with the things of God, you know. You don't throw over tables and then pray for them later. Like, <laughs> but Jesus did everything from this place of rest. Notice this. What is rest? Rest is not the absence of activity. Rest is ordered activity. He says, I only do what I see my father. What I give a revelation of my father desiring, I'm constantly, he's constantly speaking. He's constantly healing. He's going in and out of the temple. He's going to, from one village to another. He is obviously engaged in activity, but his activity is not from a place of striving or human effort. His activity is from a place of ordered relationship. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, what does this have to do with this passage that you just read to us? Because I'm trying to track with you. I know exactly where I'm going. Leave me alone. You know me. I'm going to get there. <laughs> the rest began in creation and is seen throughout Scripture as God's original intent. Every, now follow me. I know it's difficult to see it through this passage, but I want you to see this through the lens of, notice this, not just temptation, a solicitation toward evil to try to get me to mess up, say God's mad. I want you to see this temptation of Jesus, here it is, hmm, in the wilderness, very interesting, as a fight to get him out of his posture, out of his internal motivation of rest in the sufficiency and in the assignment of the Lord into his own efforts, into striving. I want you to see this text with new lenses because Jesus is now walking through the wilderness. Notice the parallel. We talked about the wilderness the children of Israel walked through last week because God rarely takes you from Egypt to your promised land without a wilderness in between. And when you begin to see that, you realize that some wildernesses are induced by God. Don't try to rebuke the devil. Don't try to pray it out. Some things you have to walk through because they are the purpose of God. And there's all sorts of blessing in the wilderness. Wildernesses, follow me, are a place of either, write this down, promotion or demotion. See, most of us don't understand the purpose of wilderness, and we struggle with wildernesses in our lives because we, or we complain through the wilderness, we cuss through the wilderness. But wildernesses are a place always of promotion or demotion. We find the children of Israel on the 11-day journey, which should have taken 11 days for 40 years, like L.A. traffic, five minutes away for an hour. Anybody ever been there? We find them on an 11-day journey for 40 Years. Why? Because they didn't get the lesson of the wilderness. They didn't see God as their, their source, the lesson that was to be carried over into the promised land. So God allowed them to walk around on an 11-day journey for 40 years. Why? Because they didn't get it. And when you don't get it, you pass the test again. Uh, it works in public school, but not in things of the spirit. You don't get just passed along because of your age. In the spirit, you have a full beard, 200 pounds, and sitting in a first grade desk. If you didn't get the lesson, or pass the test, 
you be there with that full beard, right? The little death. We see them continuing the journey to get the same lesson. Jesus gets it immediately. He doesn't need to journey. He is Jesus. Jesus walks through this wilderness experience and comes out in a way that is remarkable. I believe if we can follow his pattern, we can come out in the same way. But in order to do that, we have to see this through the lenses of the rest God wants to give us. Here Jesus is in the wilderness. Many of us are stuck between, we don't do it quite as good as Jesus. We are stuck between often the chair and the bricks. Is there anybody who will be honest enough with me to say, yeah, we love God, we, we walk with God, we're serving God, we come to church, we, um, you know, to the best of our ability, attempt to journey with the Lord, but we're stuck often between the chair and the bricks, between the rest of God and functioning out of a place of knowing and Striving in our own human efforts to make something happen, even if it violates the will of God. And for the record, violating the will of God is not always the quote-unquote sins that we like to throw around. Sometimes violating the will of God is getting ahead of God in our own efforts to make something happen. Yeah, it's easy. You can do ministry with bricks. Yeah, you can have the song of Zion in your mouth with bricks. You could lead a church but be building with bricks. You could have a wonderful podcast but a brick podcast talking about God but rarely interacting or trusting the God you're talking about to be the source are the accelerant of your platform. You are trying to take it into your own hands. You're building with brick that which can be constructed by the mental ingenuity or human ingenuity. I know you won't be honest in here. I won't get too many amens, but it's cool. We walk stuck between this tension, stuck between these realities. But I want you to note from Jesus something that he does here as he's stuck between these two realities. I challenge you to see this narrative not just as the classic narrative or solicitation to evil, which are three, three, uh, 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 threefold. Number one, lust of the flesh. Turn these stones to bread. Gratify your flesh. Because you can only be tempted in three categories. Number one, to, 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 it's when you just... just just want to, I just want to feel good. And sometimes the enemy will try to lure you out in a sensual manner. Not just physically or intimately, but sometimes it's an appetite. Just give me one more of those chicken wings. Yeah, yeah, we would talk about that in church, right? Listen, listen. Yeah, we talk about sex and, you know, and, you know, drugs. And we don't talk about gluttony. Why are you so quiet? It's in the same Bible. I like to just open more of it up. That's it. All right? All right, let's get off of that. Let's move back because we're going to go to brunch right after this. Um, I am. But I'm going to remember this. Um, I digress. This idea of, this idea of lust of the flesh. Temptation number one, lust of the eyes, what your eyes are able to see, and temptation to go and acquire outside of God's will what your eyes see, uh, envy, jealousy, but also act wanting or desiring what your eyes see, but a willingness to move outside of God's will to go and acquire. Then there is the pride of life. He takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and he says, just jump down. His angels will catch you. They'll take you up in their arms so that you will not Dash your foot against the stone. Jump, God will catch you. In other words, you're up here to become more spiritual. You're up here for God's purposes, but make it now about your purposes and not God's purposes. If I had time to talk about it, I would talk about the challenge I have with many biblical teachers that teach this concept that you can obligate God to do whatever you want God to do because it's in God's word. Well, people tried that before. It didn't work out too good. You remember when Jesus fed the 5,000, they came back and they asked the next day for another uh, free fish meal. (laughs) Jesus was like, listen, I did not come to earth to serve up catfish dinners. And he starts getting real spiritual. He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. (laughs) I love the line. He says, he lost many disciples that day. (laughs) Um, He was on the cover of Time 
right? For the fastest growing kingdom movement. And people were like high-fiving the disciples like, I knew we chose right, you know. And then he's on the cover of Time the next month for the biggest church split in history, you know. Loses everybody. The disciples like, man, I know I shouldn't have left my fishing business. <laughs> listen, listen. It is, it, is the, it is the lust of the eyes of the pride of life. They tried to make it about them. In fact, in that passage, the people that wanted them to make another free fish sandwich quoted the Bible verbatim and said, did you not hear what that Moses gave them bread from heaven? They used the word to try to obligate Jesus to doing what they wanted Jesus to do. Jesus says, that's not how it works. You're here about my business. I'm not here about your business. Jesus models this for us as he's in the wilderness. He says, listen, yes, God can catch me. It says in his word that he'll catch me if I jump. He says, but also the Lord does not like to be put to the test. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes pride of life. And while I love that, that was what it was about. But there is a deeper picture here. There is a solicitation. Can't you see it? It is to get Jesus not only to compromise and to sin, like I've always taught this, to disqualify him to pay the price for our sin. But there's an attempt to get him to, to step out of the rest, to step out of the rhythm, to step out of the movement of God. Because rest is a rhythm. There's no balance in life. You'll never get balance in life. You'll drive yourself crazy trying to get balance in life. There's no balance. God shows us from the beginning that it is a rhythm. I love rhythm over balance, being in step, being in tune with every cycle of life. With every week, there is a day of rest. With every month, there should be work into the rhythm of our life, not only physical rest, but into our entire life, this, this posture of rest where we're depending on the Lord to, to, to govern and to inspire and to drive our actions. This this showdown in the wilderness is to get Jesus up out of that posture of rest into striving to build what God never ordained. And the reality is that is one of the most difficult fights we'll be in in our entire life. And I'm telling you right now, I'm looking at a people who have been wearied. Can I just talk to a few folks that have gotten eight, nine hours of sleep, but you wake up feeling more worn out than you went to bed? And sometimes it's not the physical rest you need, but it's the internal ordering that will give you rest from the inside out. Jesus promises, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Not just rest for your body, not just rest for your mind, but rest for your soul. And if I have rest in my soul, the rest of of me often responds to the rest in my soul. Many of us don't have rest because we're striving to earn things that Christ has already secured for us spiritually. Some of us don't have rest because we're trying to bring into our life things that God has ordained prematurely. Some of us don't have rest. Let me just call the roll real quick. Because we're trying to force a fit in a relationship building with brick. But when you build with what God gives, you never have to force anything because with bricks you have to force and craft. That is mental, that is human ingenuity. But with stone, they would carve the stone at the quarry before it ever got to the temple. All the pieces seamlessly fit together. You know the statement, if it don't fit, don't force it? That is a statement of rest. Are you still here with me? So many of us are worn down and have no bandwidth to do what the Lord requires because we're rest, we're, we're, we are, excuse me, we are wearied because we're engaging in what God never ordained and what God is not favoring. He says, come to me all you weary and heavy laden next week and I'll give you rest. Uh, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. We'll talk about this next week. But what is rest? Rest is not adding anything to your life as a requirement that is not 
required, particularly religious requirement, that God has not commanded or demanded or required of you. Yeah, rest, he says. What's the solicitation? He tries to get the Jesus out of the chair. Number one, we find he says, listen, turn, turn these stones to bread. Turn these stones to bread. Now, I want you to look at these not just through the lenses of the lust of the flesh. Notice, he says, turn, turn these stones to bread. How do we lose our rest? How do we get out of a position of rest in God into human ingenuity in our own efforts? Number one. He says, turn these stones to bread. In other words, perform an act not required by God or in line with your purpose to prove something. Let me ask you a question. Think about the activity in our lives. How much of it is required by God versus how much of it is us proving something? Proven to that boy who called you. You ever watch Jerry Springer back in the day? I know you're saved now. You don't watch it now. But I mean, back in the day. You know, they had those, those shows where it's like, you know, like, you know, Bad Tooth Betty or whatever it was. Like, you know, in, in, in fifth grade, you know, and, you know, they just made fun of me, you know. But now I'm going to show them. And she's a bombshell. She's a supermodel, you know. She comes back on the show, you know. You know. I'm going to show him. And there's a build-up, ooh, you know, ah. And, you know, they have Jimmy back in the back who, who, who made fun of her, you know, and, and played her. She, you know, she wrote him a note, and, you know, box, yeah, you, will you be my G friend? Box, yes, box, no. He put box, no. <laughs> you know, the look at me now episode. So Jimmy, you know, gets dusted off. He comes out, you know, disheveled. You know, he didn't know where he's coming. He thought he'd sit in the studio audience, but they have him on the show. <laughs> Comes out and sits down and looks over and she walks by and, you know, sachets in front of him. And, you know, Jimmy, you know, looking. Remember me, Jimmy? <laughs> Jimmy's humbled by life at this point, you know. Jimmy's like, you're beautiful, but not really, I don't. She's like, I'm bad to Betty, ring a bell, you know. He's like, not really, but you're beautiful. What are you doing after this, you know? Now, this, she spent her whole life working. Every time she was in the gym. Every time she ordered that good hair. I mean, she worked that whole week picking the outfit. Her whole life was ordered by proving Jimmy wrong. And she gets there. Jimmy don't know who she is. <laughs> Great work. <laughs> but the wrong outcome. We can laugh about that, but the reality is how much, how many of us are constructing bricks? How many of us have moved out of the rhythm and the rest of God because we've been courted by performance, performance to, to please those around us. The devil said, come on, do a trick. Hey, come on, Jesus, stunt real quick. I know it's the lust of the flesh, but let's get beneath that. Get up out of your chair, out of your God-given assignment, and get into, follow me, performance mode. Perform for us, Jesus. Do a trick for us, Jesus. Turn this stone into bread, Jesus. I tell you, temptation we all face to perform, to prove something to people who don't even recognize us. And even if they did, we're in striving because it was not what God required. It's not the lane he called us to run in. And now we've drifted from our purpose for a result that may not even matter. Drifting. You got up from your chair because someone wanted you to perform. 
How about this? Sometimes the performance comes externally, but sometimes it's internal. There's brokenness personally. There's something we're trying to prove to ourselves. We don't feel good enough. So if we're not noticed in our chair, if we're not noticed in rest, if we're not noticed in God's purpose, we go and try to apply to our life what we see in everybody else. Well, it got her noticed. I may as well try it. It got him noticed. Let me apply that to my life. We end up building bricks because while we look successful externally, internally we feel worthless. Can I tell you where brick building comes from, from moving from rest to labor? It is not just of salvation, but it's of the rhythm of our life. We move into labor when there's a blues clue in the scripture. Before Satan never gets to, again, before the lust of the flesh, turn these stones into bread, it's not just about the food, it is about Another issue altogether, While, why Jesus is able to stand his ground is because he was anchored by something that was not external. He was anchored by something deeper than performance for others. Satan tries to get him with what he gets us with. If you are really the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. Jesus had just been baptized in the Jordan right before this passage in chapter 3. He gets up out of the water, the heavens are parted, and God looks and says, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He goes, the Bible says, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And as he's standing in the wilderness, Satan comes. And the first temptation is to turn stones to bread. But he said, hey, perform this if you really are the son of God. Can I tell you that most of our brick-laying performances in life, us moving out of rest into striving, is because we don't, do not have a secure identity. And here's why we're worn out. We're running from trying to rest to, to, to trying to go and make something happen and to try to be seen, to, 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 to resting, to, to uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it's difficult being here. It makes me feel better if people can see what I'm doing or, or if I can achieve or accomplish something even though I'm lacking peace in doing this because it's not congruent with God's will. I've got to do it anyway. I'm driven. And I, I'm not anti-technology, but we're living in a culture like never before. Well, not only is this an issue, an identity issue, but also this idea of what our eyes see is seductive because we are getting the highlight reels of everybody's life. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, once a week. We, people wait for a good one. I mean, they're waiting. Listen, you see back to back. There's three posts a year. They've been waiting on that, that real vacation. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about where they really spend money. I'm not, I, know everybody, I know everybody in here is not super religious, so I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm going to hit on everybody. Well, where they bring out that, 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 that bottle, you know, with a vintage... 30 years old, you know what I mean? And, and they, they post it, you know, online or, or you know, in church world, you know, they, they wait until, you know, the church is packed. It could be a picture from five years ago. And they have that photographer that has that angle from the side that makes it look like it's 20,000. <laughs> and you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and you're getting the best two shots of somebody's life back to back, to back, to back, to back. And when you see that, it's easy to ask to feel like you're behind. When you see that, it's easy to feel like God has forgotten about you. Why? I mean, everybody's a CEO. You see, like, everybody? Everybody is a boy boss, girl boss, everybody. Nobody works for anybody anymore. Nobody. And so you're like, man, I gotta, uh, I can't, uh, I gotta get out of here. I've gotta start an empire. Well, can I give you the behind the scenes? They they took a picture in front of somebody else's high rise. That was a good photo shoot. Listen, they are not on the thirtieth floor. That they, that that's not their building. If they just pan up, you the name on you know the building, they just cropped out. And you on there like, they got a building, Lord, and I'm just trying to get a car. <laughs> and 
And so we're constantly now in moving from a place of resting in God's, here it is, I, I want you to get this down, resting in God's direction, re, re, we move from a place of resting in God's, no, timing, we move from a place of resting in God's sufficiency, that means he has a supply that is not exhausted, and we move from a place of resting in God's sufficiency, we move from resting in God's sovereignty. Which means God still has the last say. Say, God's still in control, in charge. When my efforts come to an end, God still has a play. Well, come on, yeah. See, what, what takes away our rest is assuming that the only, only what our hands, our mind can produce is what we'll experience. What allows us to rest is knowing that it's not all God, it's not all me, but I'm not using brick. My own sufficiency, I'm taking, I'm partnering with God, taking stone, what is from creation. I'm taking stone, I'm partnering with God in this life that is being built. I can do it from a place of rest when I realize that I am, I'm not the only one coming. This is what the Bible means in many respects when it says that they had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. We say the name of God. We worship the Lord. We sing songs like, Lord, you make a way. We sing songs like, our God's a healer, a deliverer. You never let me down. All these things, but we live as if there's nobody else coming. Like prayer won't move anything. Like God's not involved. Like he doesn't see the position of your heart. And he's not still the one that allows you to be promoted or to experience the motion. We live as if God has no involvement in this natural and adorning world in which we live. That's what gets us out of that chair into human striving. Can I tell you, human striving is fatiguing. It will wear you down. Some of y'all just drug in here today. I, I, I see you. I feel you because I know what it is to strive in my own ability and my own effort to not leave room for God. I know what it is. The devil tried to get him to perform. He said, go ahead and stunt. Yeah, yeah, stunting is not just a big chain with Bugatti. You can stunt in every category of life. You can church stunt. Yeah. I mean, well, you're going to make it happen. The meeting's not going good enough, doesn't feel powerful enough. And it's like you make up a tongue like to throw in. The <laughs> it wasn't even cracking like that. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? And I get it. Sometimes God really moves on you like that. But. You know, sometimes we recreate what happened when God really did move on us. We master the art of the illusion that God is in the place to get it cracking. That's building with bricks. That is building with bricks. Natural and carnal construction in a spiritual environment, but it's bricks nonetheless. Yes, yeah, stunting's not just chains and Bugattis. Stunting can be church stunting. All right, let me move on. Make the church people uncomfortable. So, <laughs> let's close this out. Stone bread. Then he says, I will give you whatever your eyes can see. Move from what, listen, eyes see. He's trying to get him out of the chair, get him out of the position of rest. He says, listen, if you just bow down to me, subtle compromise. I just need you to go from here to here real quick. I won't tell anybody. You get up, Jesus, and listen. All the kingdoms of the world and their splendor will all be yours. Yeah. This is a picture, you're taking notes, of compromise based on what our eyes are able to see. Temptation to compromise to get or to get to something more quickly. So here's what's crazy. Um, the enemy will try to move us from a place of rest and journey with God. We're cool for a while until God starts taking God's time. He doesn't do it fast enough. Where we know we have a promise from God or we have a dream that is larger than where we are, but we are tired of being too big for a small place. Yeah, I wish I could talk about that, but I got to catch a flight. Too big for a small place. Too big for the job that you're working in. You got dreams. You have dreams. 
too big to be talked to the way that you're talked to on, in, in that space. You, you, you are giving insights to people that you're more qualified than. Too big for a small place. In a relationship where you're being tolerated. And they don't even know what they have. Too big for a small place. It's frustrating to be too big for a small place. Bigger in your heart than you are in your station in life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's frustrating to be there for longer than you want to be. And you start pulling out your clock. And you're starting to see other things in other people's lives. You're starting to see this acceleration of their journey and their path. Not realizing that God has a path for you. Now, where am I in the text? I'm not drifting because if you really look at this text, the enemy said, I'll give you the entire kingdom of the world if you'll just bow down to me right here and right now. Subtle compromise to get where you're going. Don't do the whole structure, Jesus. Just lay a couple bricks. And you'll get everything that you have coming your way. And temptation is when you start seeing it. How did she do it? I'm going to I'm I'm tear up the club right now. You ready? Man, I'm, I ain't waiting. I'm, a job. Man, man, give me that form for that PPP. <laughs> Y'all better be careful. <laughs> be careful out in those streets. <laughs> that wait five, ten years. You have kids and moved on with your life. You start a church and here they come to get you for that EDD. But God is taking too long. I want my big Louis purse. I'm seeing all of it around me. And the temptation is to come out of God's purpose and plan to just go right over here because God's taking too long. To lay some bricks, to, to put some things down, uh, just, just to get ahead. Small compromise to get to where you are going. Not realizing. He said, if you just bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Follow me. Now, God had it for him anyway. But the challenge with God's journey is he had to go from the wilderness to do three years of ministry, had to go and agonize in Gethsemane, had to have his flesh ripped from his body, had to be hung from a cross after he died. He was died, then he had to be buried. After he was buried, he then resurrects. And it's not until the moment that he resurrects that he declares all power of the heaven and earth is in my hand. God, if you do it his way, it may be longer, but it always will be better. God, I wish I had time to talk about how much better it is. The devil, the enemy through compromise promised that I will give you the splendor of the kingdoms of the world. He went God's way and God says, I'm going to give you not just the kingdoms of the world. I'm giving you heaven and earth just to show that if you can get through it God's way, he will always upgrade you when you walk properly through your wilderness season. And this is not my message, but I don't know who I'm talking to. There's somebody right now in the middle of a wilderness season and got the brick in your back pocket about to stack it up. God sent me to declare, put the brick down and get back in your position of rest. Because anything that you get through compromise, you have to continue to compromise to keep it. But whenever God gets ready to do something, you may have to go through hell, high water, but what I can promise you, no matter the challenge, you always resurrect. You always bounce back. You always come through it. And when you come through the other side of what God has for you, you don't have to worry about beating people off with a stick because God made it happen. And whatever God makes happen, God will keep in order. Is there anybody? God. Woo, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, stop that, man. I have. 
We have guests. I'm trying to be dignified, but I feel this thing. Yeah, I feel this thing. I feel a little Baptist right now. Forgive me. I feel some Baptist roots. I may have to go to Calvary. I may have to suffer for a minute to get to where God's going, doing with it. But whatever God is doing, I'm with it. I may have to suffer. It may take longer, but when you're mature, you don't mind taking longer. Because some things can be crock-potted, but other things take time. Some things can be microwaved, but other things take time. I mean, microwave, but other things take time. Some things can be done quickly, but other things take time. That's why it says that the righteous are like a tree planted by the river of water. Listen, who bear forth their fruit in season. I don't want what God does not have for me. I don't want, listen, I don't want it. If God doesn't have it for me, I want to bear it in season. Not only do I not want it if God doesn't have it for me, I don't want to have it before God wants it for me. Because I'll take a good thing and mess it up. I'll take a good woman and mess them up. I'll take a good friendship and mess it up. I'll take a good business and run it into the ground. If I get into receiving fruit before it's time, but when is my time? Now I understand what he meant when he said, wait, I say wait on the Lord. Now I understood what he meant when he said, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not walk and not get weary. They'll run and not faint. Anybody willing to wait? To, to rest. To rest. To rest. I don't want to go, but I have to go. I could spend this whole week with you. But listen to me. What is rest? Let me, let me make it plain for you. What is rest? Rest is, rest is, but yeah. can I make it relational? Because we can get real technical. And in the Western world, we like technical. We like technical. We like definition. Uh, but, but I don't know that this is a, a Western experience. It is. It is relational. What's rest? Jesus lets us know. Rest is knowing that you have a father. Knowing, yes, knowing is knowing the whole time. If you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son. No, 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 no. What orders my life and what gives me rest is knowing I have a father, knowing I'm not out by myself. No matter what it feels like, friends may come and go. But I have a father who father who walks with me. I have a father who talks with me. I have a father that tells me I'm his own. I have a father that is here when I'm up and I'm winning. I have a father that is here when I'm losing. I have a father when I'm victorious and I'm naked and make him proud. But I also have a father when I fall and make mistakes and stumble along the way who's still there waiting on me, who's still in the race with me, who's still present with me. I have, I have a father. I have a father. I have have someone with me. They're the witness of God. The witness. The witness of God. So Jesus said, he said, he said, y'all listen. He said, don't, don't. I, I know that you, you have needs. I know, I know that you're, you're hungry. Somebody, he said, I know that you, you want clothes. He said, I know all that. He said, I know all that. He says, but your heavenly father, there it is again, knows you have need of all those things. It is never that I'm not going to give it to you. It is always how I choose to order it. Oh, 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 best believe. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm going to get it either way. I'm always going to happen either way. But God says, I don't want you to move into your own ingenuity absent of my favor to try to make this happen. He says, you have a heavenly father. Who knows? Can I just camp right there? Who, a heavenly father, who knows? I, I'm grateful that I have a heavenly father and I'm not in this thing alone. But I love that I not just have a heavenly father that protects me and a heavenly father that guides me. I have a heavenly father who is intimately acquainted with me. A heavenly father who knows. Yeah. He knows every tear I cry. He knows the stuff that's keeping me up at night. 
He knows when it feels like I'm coming to my end. He knows when I'm, when I'm doing my best. And, and, and my kids are looking at me. And my spouse is looking at me like, what you going to make happen? And I know I've already done my best and don't know what my next move. You have a heavenly father who knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. You have a heavenly father who's not ascendant or away from you, but a heavenly father that is close to you that still counts the hair on your head, that still sees every tear that falls from your eye, that is intimately acquainted with your wilderness journey. You have a heavenly father who knows. What does he know? He knows that you have need of all. Of these things. So he says, don't, don't run after it like the pagans of this world. What is he saying? Don't run after it as those who don't have a heavenly father who knows. He says, you can put the bricks down. He said, you don't have to make it all happen. You don't have to make it all work. You have a heavenly father who knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. And because he knows... You can rest, not physically, but you can rest in your soul. It's not that he doesn't have it for you. It's the way he chooses to order it in your life. He just reorchestrates the composition of blessing. He says, don't go after it to try to make it happen as your first priority. He says, I want you to rest in me. How do you rest in him? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness. I know what you need out there. He said, all these things will be added to you. I know how to open doors. I know how to make a way. I know how to elevate you. I know how to make your name great. I know how to take that good thing you're doing in private. You think everybody's unaware of. I know how to put it on the world stage. I'm a heavenly father that knows. Seek first. My kingdom and all this will be added to you. Can I tell you how to rest? Last thing and we're done. You rest when you only want what God adds. Oh, that's a sweet place to be. When I, when I only want for my life what God adds. When I only want for my family what God adds. When I only want for my ministry what God adds. When I only want what God adds. And I know you think I'm crazy. You think I've drifted from the text. I know exactly where I am. And the reason I didn't stop it after the temptation of Jesus, because the last verse says, and I love his word. God, I love your word. It said that he came out of the wilderness different than he went into the wilderness. That's why you have to thank God for every wilderness. Because your wilderness... Is either a place of promotion or demotion. There was not one recorded miracle of Jesus before the wilderness. There was not one blind eye open before the wilderness. There was not one dead person raised before the wilderness. There was no water to wine before the wilderness. The Bible declares that he went into the wilderness led by the Spirit. But he came out of the wilderness in the power of of the Spirit. When you learn to rest in the Lord, when you learn that He is your source and you depend on His sovereignty and sufficiency, when you know it's not all on you, but you're partnering with God, I promise you'll come out of the wilderness better than you went in. You'll come go in led, but come out with a power that you didn't have. Come out with a grace that you didn't have. Come out with some lessons that you did not have. Is there anybody at this juncture that can thank God for every wilderness. I cried some tears. I had to struggle. I didn't know how it was all going to work, but God carried me every step of the way. And I want to give him praise because after I emerged, I'm not the same person I was when I went into the wilderness. I got to go for real. I'm going to miss my flight. But listen, I got to leave you with this, because y'all are real spiritual, but let me help you out. If you can get real spiritual and seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, God has no problem with material. 
God has no problem with influence. God has no problem with elevation. He tells Joshua when he gets through to the other side, I'm going to make your name great. And I thought it was just a mistake until I get to Jesus' wilderness. It didn't just say he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, but it said word about him begin to spread to every town. If you walk through this thing right, if you can wait on the Lord, if you refuse to bow your knee, to compromise, to get ahead, God may not come when you want him, but I promise you, he'll be right on time and he will bring favor. He will bring promotion. He will bring elevation in the name of Jesus. Rest, 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 rest in the Lord. Amen, amen. I can truly say I've missed that. You don't get that, you don't get that on Zoom. You don't get that energy, you don't get that feeling. It's just, it's just, I've missed that. <laughs> awesome word. Let us learn to rest in the Lord. Not in our own strength, but in the Lord. Rest in God. He knows all about us. He loves us. He cares about us. He see our beginning from our end. And it's, I love that scripture that says, God says, I know the plan he has for us. And it's for good and not evil. So we can truly trust and we can rest in God. Awesome word. Thank you, Pastor Wayne. So, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good word. Good word. Call that a rhema word, a now word. That's we need that. We needed that. I needed that. So, anyway, we're here. It's good to be in the house. It's good to see you guys. See your face. Feel the energy. It's beautiful. Um, if there's anybody, first time visitor here, we welcome you. We don't believe it's by accident that you're here, but it's, it's a God ordained moment. We thank you for coming. Our Pastor Wayne, Pastor Lady Mai, would love to meet you one day. We get to welcome you to the family. We thank you for coming out. And for you that are longtime members, we welcome you too. It's good to see you. It's good to see your face. It's good to be in the house with all of God's children and my brothers and sisters. We're going to continue in our service. We're going to go to tithes and offering. Um, let's be fair, hearts and minds. That is, that is a form of worship also to God tithes and offering. So I was searching the scripture. I was, I was trying to sit, figure out what am I going to say about tithes and offering because we've probably all heard all the scriptures about tithes and offering, right? I mean, we, we regurgitate it all the time. But I was searching last night. I was like, you know, God told me to Proverbs 3 and 9. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And it says, putting our treasures to good use for the sake of the church our communities and the benefit of others is how we honor him, right? Honor God. Okay, you didn't like that one? Okay. Okay. I'm thinking of Romans 11, 36. <laughs> it, is, it says, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. Everything we have, everything we are, it comes from God. take our stuff way too seriously. We think we got, you know, we do we do stuff, but everything we are, everything we put our hands to, that bear fruit, it all comes from God. And it's a blessing from him, right? So he bless us with talents, gifts, abilities, and it's all for his glory and his purpose. So the tithes and offering is a consistent reminder to us to keep us grounded that it's all take ourselves, we think we're doing something that we're not, right? So to, what it does to me, it reminds me 